Thank you. Oh. <laughs> the, an unexpected interest in the Java memory model. Um, just to be sure that you're not in the wrong room, I'm going to talk about Java concurrency today. And what I'm trying to do today is that I want to explain to you um, the primitives in the Java language or in, in the Java virtual machine for writing concurrent programs. And uh, you probably came across uh, the, the modifiers that I'm going to discuss today, which are like volatile, synchronized, uh, and final. Uh, and what I kind of want to explain to you today is what the consequences of using these modifiers are in the Java language. And I want to do it in a way that is approachable to anybody. Um, because quite honestly, the Java memory model made easy is the title of the talk, but it's uh, for a very flexible interpretation of the word easy. Um, the Java memory model isn't easy. In its core, it's not easy. It's a very academic um, definition of how the Java virtual machine is allowed to um, handle concurrency and handle memory uh, in a Java program. And uh, the model itself has been revised multiple times. So since Java 5 for the first time, it's, it's kind of been usable in the broader sense for uh, yeah, complex concurrent applications. And uh, all the work in the memory model comes straight from PhD theses. So, so if you want to read like the formal definition of how it is actually defined, uh, the Java virtual machine is specification driven, so you, you can look up at Oracle's web page the Java language specification, which defines everything, all the, the values you can use, the primitives. And the last section, chapter 7, is dedicated exclusively to the Java memory model. But the section also is right out of a uh, PhD thesis, so if you're not very much into the terminology and uh, the formalism behind it, it's a very hard thing to understand. And I basically want to cut this out today and just show you um, what, what the thing is in, in reality, like in, in terms that we work with every day. Right, so why is, this a, why is the Java memory model a thing? Uh, isn't it just that you read variables and you write variables? And for the most, that's true. Like if you code in Java, you, you assign a variable and you read the variable later and then you expect this value to be visible. Uh, and in, in the, the broad sense, that's also true for most Java programs. Um, but the problem is that uh, Java needs to be um, yeah, optimized, right? So if you write a Java program and you run it through Java C, you compile it, you will get a class file, right? And this class file is still a pretty good representation of your original program. Uh, Java C is not an optimizing compiler. Uh, Java C uh, is basically just translating it into something that's more machine readable, uh, uh, but it's not doing like uh, optimizations like removing code or um, yeah, optimizing method calls and so forth. It's just creating a, a source file, converting it into a binary format. Um, but then, right, so this, this is then the bytecode. But at runtime, the Java virtual machine, and that's not always been like that, the Java virtual machine takes the bytecode and it runs it through a JIT compilation process. Or with Graal, uh, more and more, also through a head of time compilation. And uh, the thing is, if you run a Java program without these optimizations, it's pretty slow. And Java used to be slow in the early days, uh, in version 1. It didn't have a JIT compiler. And only because of JIT compilers uh, and, and a head of time compilation today, uh, Java programs are uh, competitive. They are so fast that you can actually run them in, in high uh, load systems. But in order to optimize a program, you have to change the code. So you will have to, for example, switch around write order uh, and, and read order of variables. So it might be that the program, the Java program you've written, is executed in an entirely different way uh, on the, the hardware that you're actually running in the end. And also the processes, they're doing a lot of tricks to optimize code. And uh, when you write multi threaded programs, then the code might be executed in a different manner than what you expected, right? So Java code, in a way, is just a metaphor. Uh, it's, it's something, it describes the semantics of your program. The actual execution might be something very different. And that's why a memory model is needed um, in, in the JVM, to, to make sure that your program still runs correctly, right? Um, the first thing that... Uh, you might observe when you run a concurrent program is that Java doesn't uh, guarantee sequential consistency necessarily. Sequential consistency means that, uh, let's see, we have this very simple program. We have two variables, foo and bar, and they're zero in the beginning, and then we add one to, to foo, and then we add one to bar, and then we add uh, two to foo again. That's your Java program, right? What can an optimizing compiler do? And this is very trivial, so even uh, a stand, uh, like an average um, newly graduated programmer can find a better way of writing this code, right? You can just add 
uh, both values to foo immediately and sum this up. This is something you would expect a compiler to write for you. But what's the consequence of optimizing this program? If we run this uh, normally, like we run this method, uh, and we observe the values from a different thread, right? We access foo and bar from somewhere else. We would uh, expect them always to be uh, zero or one or three foo in the end, right? But the problem with executing this program that way is, uh, and we'll just take a very simple processor now. We have main memory storing foo and bar. And then we want to add foo. How is this working on hardware? We take a very simple processor now that only has one cache slot. And you understand that that's not how hardware works in reality, but f the simplification is still valid. First, we have to read the value foo into the processor cache. We cannot operate directly on main memory. That's not nothing op that processors can do. So we have to read the value. Then the processor knows how to increment the value. 0 plus 1 is 1. And then it has to write it back into main memory. Because we only have one slot. Cache is very limited. Now we can execute bar, uh, load it into the cache again, increment it, and write it back. And now we can do it again with foo and increment it and write it back, right? You see the inefficiency here. That's what happens on the hardware. We have limited cache capabilities. So what the JVM and the processor both have to do to make your program fast is to optimize uh, yeah, cache reads and cache writes. That's a very crucial aspect of, of writing an efficient Java program. And the consequence of optimizing this is, of course, to summarize, uh, uh, to, to, to basically uh, switch the order of the increment, and that's a, a, a right uh, um, order reordering, right? This is the optimization happening. But what's the consequences? Now we read from a different thread, and originally we would either see foo and bar to be zero, or we would see foo to be one and bar to be zero, or foo to be one and bar to be one, or foo to be three and bar to be one. That's the three outcomes that we can explain when we look at our source code, right? But now we observe after the optimization, and suddenly we observe foo to be zero, then we see foo to be 1 and bar to be 1. But suddenly we see a program state where foo is 3 and bar is 0. And if you look at the source code above here, the source code you have written, this is not explainable, right? Suddenly, the JVM has done an optimization that makes your code uh, look differently from another thread. Uh, and again, foo is 3 and bar is 1. This is something we would expect. But this new outcome here is spurious. There's one previous outcome that we will never observe suddenly, uh, even though we would, might expect this in a sampling environment, and then this new outcome that we would never expect, and this suddenly becomes a reality. Of course, the next optimization is to summarize these two increments. That makes the spurious outcome that we would never expect even more likely. And this is basically what concurrent programs uh, have to avoid, right? If you write concurrent code, this might be a bug. This might be a concurrency bug, um, because if Another, if, if there's a more complex combination of fields, these fields might take values that you cannot explain uh, to observe in this, in this combination. And it's because of the Java memory model and the processes and the, the, the JVM's desire to optimize your, your application. And just to make sure that everybody also understands that this is necessary, we could, of course, say that's, that's a, a problematic uh, thing for the JVM to do. We should just avoid this, and the, the JVM should not optimize these things to make Java programming easier. And that's a fair tag. And there's programming languages that don't aim for efficiency, uh, but they aim for, for, for ease, ease of use. And then they might not do this reordering. But if you uh, want to do an increment and you can read the value from cache in nanoseconds, that's half a nanoseconds to fetch something from, from a L1 cache. But if you need something, uh, to fetch from main memory, it's already 100 nanoseconds. And if main memory even isn't enough and you have to fetch something from disk, then uh, it's, it's all suddenly 8,000 nanoseconds. And just to, to um, materialize this, this is like uh, reading something um, from main memory basically is, is going to another town when uh, reading something from cache is uh, going to your neighbor's house. And reading something from disk is basically flying to the moon and back. So, so in this kind of uh, sense, uh, it is very important that the JVM aggressively optimizes your code, and it does that, uh, and very, very well, actually. This is why Java still is very popular in the enterprise. Uh, you can write bad programs, and the JVM still kind of optimizes in a way that executes them quickly. Right. So, so just the dimensions. And this is why, why there's more and more improvement in this area, and every JVM might do new optimizations that, if your program is incorrect, triggers uh, poor outcomes. 
So that's the first thing. Sequential consistency might be a problem. The next thing that without correctly synchronizing your program is uh, eventual consistency. Look at this program. We have a flag that's true or false, and we have a count. So we have one thread that just runs a loop and incurrence the count uh, until the flag is set to false. And we set this flag to false from the second thread. If you do not add any um, yeah, concurrency primitives to your program, this might happen. And this is a, le a legal outcome for a Java program. Processor 1 has its own cache, and processor 2 has its own cache. Again, we simplify to just one slot each, so we can actually discuss this here. And processor 1 reads just count, right? Processor 1 realizes, I never write to, to flag, so I just uh, ignore it for the, for the time being, and I just increment. Processor 2 never writes to count, but only to flag, so it does the same thing for the flag variable. So they both read the value they are, yeah, interested in and uh, operate on these values, right? So what, what happens here is that, again, the JVM can optimize from the perspective of a single thread. Uh, the first thread is optimized to this. So it will always run. It will never terminate, even though you set the flag true. You know that you executed the second thread, but since you didn't synchronize these threads in any way, this value is never considered to be um, updated. The second thread just says, all right, I'm writing to this variable, but for me, for my thread, this doesn't have a consequence, so I don't really ever flush the value. So even if the other thread is doing something to synchronize its memory, thread two might never write back its change of this variable to main memory where they can communicate. So those are, again, legal optimizations, and this is something you actually can uh, observe, that even though you write values, they are not updated uh, from the perspective of a different thread, and there is breaking your expectancy of what is called here eventual consistency. Right. The third issue, so now we had the two major issues, the third issue is less serious because it's not as, as common anymore uh, with 64-bit uh, processes, is that the JVM even allows you word tearing. Again, consider this program. We have a variable foo, a long variable foo, 64-bit value, uh, which is set to zero. And then we have two threads. One writes the number um, 240 million uh, something, uh, which is uh, basically the hex representative of only the last 32-bit set. And the thread two is writing the hex representation of uh, the long value with the first 32-bit set. And we might expect, if we read through from a third thread now, we might observe, uh, we might expect three outcomes. We might expect foo to be zero, we might expect foo to be the value set by thread one, or we might expect uh, the value to be the, uh, the one of thread two. One of these three, right? What we wouldn't expect would be a fourth value, but uh, if you don't correctly synchronize your program, it might just happen, because uh, in a 32-bit processor, which is still uh, used, especially in mobile devices and so forth, so if you're programming Android, uh, it might happen that these two 32-bit values, which now take two slots in the processor cache, if, it's, if that's the, ca the cache um, value, that the first value is flushed uh, in two bits. So thread one flushes the first 32 bits of its value first, which is zero, so the value remains unchanged. Now the second processor flushes its um, last 32 bits, which again is zero, so uh, we have still not changed main memory. And now both threads flush the other bits that are remaining. So now suddenly we observe the value minus one for foo. And of course, if you read your program, you will wonder how this can this be. And it can be because of word tearing. These three problems might occur in any program that you write on a JVM that is using multiple threads and that is not correctly synchronized. So uh, just an overview. And that's the other problem. If you execute this on your machine. You might never observe this. And this is likely because you're running an Intel x86, uh, which is a very common 64-bit uh, uh, processor. And uh, Intel, uh, for Intel, it doesn't make sense to do certain reorderings, um, need on a JVM's perspective. And the processor itself never does reorderings either. So for example, does Intel never reorder load loads? Meaning you read variable A and you read variable B, means they always read in this uh, order. But on an RAM uh, processor, 
this is not true. If you read variable A or variable B, it might make sense for RM or to reorder to first read value B and, and then value A. So while you might develop something on your machine and it always runs correctly, it never shows the behavior. Once you deploy to some phone, for example, or some uh, cloud computing uh, hardware, the problem might suddenly surface just there. And that makes it very difficult to understand these concurrency models, and that's why it's important to reason well about them and to isolate them well, right? And yeah, that's, that's kind of the trick <laughs> with, with uh, concurrent programs. The, the right, ones, uh, read, uh, right runs run anywhere metaphor doesn't really work there as well, because it might just work on your computer, but not on another computer. Because formally speaking, your program is incorrect. It just works by, by accident on, on your personal hardware. Right? And as I mentioned, the problem is mobile devices like chips that use less electricity, typically. ARM is well known to use less electricity than Intel, uh, for example, but is weaker often. So on heavy workstations that developers use, they use often Intel. Um, less reordering, less uh, shuffling around uh, instructions, but on your end product and your consumer devices, suddenly uh, you have this behavior. Right? And of course, mobile devices are becoming more relevant over time. Uh, and as you know, Android is a JVM implementation. It's not a standardized um, um, JVM implementation. So the memory model doesn't apply 100% there. But all in all, it's still using the same semantics there. And this is numbers from 2014. I'm expecting this to be way higher. So finally, bringing us to the core question of this talk, what is the Java memory model? The Java memory model, in, in very simple terms, answers the questions, what values can I observe when I read a certain field? Nothing more. And I mentioned before as well, it's very formal. It's, it's basically a, a, a mathematical model of orderings and uh, where every field read or field write is an action. And it says then what action needs to happen in what order. And just saying that, if you ever want to Google the Java memory model, that's the terms you'll, you'll find. But I'll try to avoid them as much as I can. And in a simple, trivial, single-threaded example, the Java memory model applies as well. But we like to not think about it. Because in the single-threaded scenario, the Java virtual machine just guarantees you that the semantics of your program will be consistent with program order. And this is a very heavy sentence to say, but what does this mean in practice? It means that we have a write action and we have a read action. This is the two primitives of the Java memory model. A write action is just assigning a value to a variable. And a read action is just reading a value from a variable. In this case, we read foo and we write foo in the first line. And in a single-threaded program, the Java virtual machine guarantees us that things are consistent with program order. And what is program order? Program order means that the write action is in the source code before the read action. So when you read the variable within the same thread, you will, of course, be able to observe the value. And that's something trivial to say. This is something you would expect from most programs. And it is, just to make sure that the distinction is clear, it doesn't mean that uh, the Java virtual machine or the processor uh, will execute these things in this order. Maybe the Java virtual machine doesn't want to write the value foo back to the field but it will execute the program as if you have written it back to the field. Because the field is normally something on the heap, right? You have a, an object single threaded here. Maybe you don't want to go all the way, so you just keep it in some cache slot. And every time you would normally read from main memory to get the value of foo, you just have this cached value here. But within the thread, it will be executed as if the value on the field foo was set to 1 there. And this is trivial. This is something we all expect from, from a normal application. But it only is valid for the single thread. It's not valid for multiple threads. Right. So intra-thread consistency, this is called in the formal model. Right. Uh, but once we branch out to having multiple threads, we have to work with, uh, with um, yeah, building blocks that the Java memory model gives us. And there's only four of them. That's the nice bit about it. Uh, there's field-scoped building blocks, final. Uh, most people know final for a, f a value can not be altered uh, anymore after the constructor, but it has more also semantics in terms of, of um, threading. And we have volatile. And then we also have method scoped um, building blocks. They're synchronized, the keyword that you can put on the method, uh, or the synchronized um, yeah, operator that you can put on a monitor. So you probably have seen this. Uh, and normally, this just means like 
don't have this exclusively, but again, it also has, has uh, implications for memory synchronization. And the, th the fourth one is the lock API. And now since Java 19 with Project Loom just being merged, uh, actually they did a big clear up of the, the internal JVM uh, lock API. So there's just one J JDK internal API that does locking anymore, but it's not exposed. The one that is exposed is Java Util Concurrent Locks. And uh, if you use these four, this is how you can correctly synchronize your program. Um, and of course, most approach that I've seen in the wild is that if a, a program doesn't behave as you would expect it in terms of concurrency, you just sprinkle volatile here and there, and at some point it works and you're happy. But this may, might make your program extremely slow. And I hope at the end of the talk that you understand why this is the case as well. Right. So uh, what does volatile do? Why do we need volatile? Again, I'll uh, just present an example program, a uh, so-called data race program. We have two threads. Thread one, again, will wait in a spin lock, checking, well, you ready? Is, are we ready? Are we ready or not? And then once we are ready, ready is being set from thread two, we assert that uh, answer is 42. In thread two, we set answer to be 42, so the correct value. We expect this program to function. And then we set ready, right? With all that we have learned so far, is this a correctly synchronized program? I hope you can agree with me that the answer is no, because the JVM might reorder uh, the field writes in thread two for some reason. Maybe ready is already in the cache, so it wants to write ready before uh, it writes answer, for example. Right? There's many, many reasons that we don't have to worry about. We have to worry about uh, that it might happen, not why it will happen, fortunately. So, we, and the, the one thing we have to do to avoid this problem is to make ready volatile. And take note, answer doesn't have to be volatile, only ready has to be volatile. And the reason for that is that introduces a so-called synchronization order. Right? Because we expect this execution order, we don't want these two to be switched around necessarily uh, so that the assertion doesn't fail. So what does a volatile field imply? A volatile field and that's the only purpose of the volatile field, is that it in introduces a uh, synchronization order. And please don't confuse this with the synchronized keyword. You already have learned about program order, and now the synchronization order doesn't uh, in introduce an order between uh, two statements in the same thread, but now uh, it introduces an ordering between two threads. Meaning that if thread two observes ready to be true, it now also has to observe everything that happened in program order in the first thread that happened before this field value was written. So meaning, if I observe true, I might observe false, but if I observe true, I will also have to be able to observe answer to be 42. So now our program is correct because all reads that have been done before the volatile field was written to have to be visible as reads in the second thread. So if you write to a volatile uh, field from one thread, uh, from the second thread, you have to observe all of these written values. And no matter if these other fields have been volatile or not, uh, they have to be um, basically set to the correct value in the other thread too. This is what the Java memory model ca calls a happens before order. So if we go back to this uh, program here, now that it is volatile, right, uh, the answer 42 has to be observable if ready is true because of the volatileness without answer being volatile itself, right? And uh, this is basically the Java memory model. If you approximately understand what it does now, then you have understood the core of Java concurrency. And this solves all of the problems that we have introduced before. We don't have the issue of sequential consistency anymore, because now we have sequential consistency. Answer has to be 42 if ready is true. Uh, also, all threads have to align their values with main memory once you write to a volatile field. This means if a thread writes to a volatile field, it cannot keep its values in the processor cache anymore. It has to flush it down to main memory so that the other thread can fetch the updated values from there. It's not longer possible what we've seen before, that we have the starvation where a thread just keeps its value in memory without introducing this new value to all other threads. And if a value is volatile and it's a long or a double, you cannot have word tiering anymore. Then it has to be written atomically to um, the memory. So the third problem with atomicity uh, that we introduced is also solved. 
So all three problems, sequential consistency, eventual consistency, and word, ter word tearing are avoided now. Uh, this does, of course, only happen if you are writing and reading to the same field. If uh, you are writing to ready but only reading answer, then the semantics wouldn't be guaranteed, right? So you have to do an operation on the same volatile field, and all these guarantees will be given to you by the JVM. But of course, uh, before you, at, at a cost, right? Because, um, no, this is the next, at a cost, because now the JVM cannot do the reordering anymore. That's the consequence, right? So if you just add volatile to everything, the JVM will be very restrained in the optimizations it can do. And the JVM doesn't do uh, reorderings for fun. The process is neither. It does it because it found out that something uh, can be optimized. Think of the very first example I showed you, where we write to the same value twice. If the foo and bar values of this very first example would have been volatile, then these reorderings wouldn't be legal. Then we would actually have to flush the cache twice in order to write to the same field. So, so your program will become slower because of it. But of course, it will become slower for a reason, uh, in this case at least, because uh, we had to introduce an ordering to make our program work correctly. So then the, 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 the de-optimization has a purpose. Same thing happens, more or less, uh, if you, you add the synchronized modifier to a method. Uh, first, we try to solve our problem with a volatile field. Synchronized is, of course, not a good solution here because it will block the thread2 method, um, so this might deadlock. But let's just assume that thread2 is first here, unless we, un otherwise we just restart the JVM. With synchronized, we have the same uh, guarantee, more or less. You all know synchronized mainly as a way of having blocks that are run exclusively by one thread. But in the Java memory model, it also has implications. Because whenever you exit a monitor from a synchronized block, and you enter the same monitor from another thread, we have again a synchronization order between these two threads. And we have again program order. Uh, the answer 42 was written before we exited the monitor. So when the other thread enters the same monitor again, it needs to be able to observe everything in program order that was written to a field before. And now it's not no longer limited to the single field uh, that is, has been volatile before and all others. Now it's the entirety, right? So as long as two threads acquire and release the same monitor, so first release and then acquire, all fields written by the first thread have to be observable by the second thread. That's the implication that Jerium uh, has here for the memory model. Uh, and of course, um, yeah, in, in this essence, it's the same guarantees with the happens before order. If you read the formal model in the Java language specification, you will again have the terms program order, synchronization order, happens before order. In, in, in the words I used now, it basically just means again, thread one wrote variables, exited the monitor. If then thread two enters the same monitor, it will be able to observe um, these values with the same guarantees. Um, of uh, um, sequential consistency, that those values are all set, of eventual consistency, that the first thread has to flush these values back to main memory, and the second thread has to fetch them from main memory. And of course, atomacy isn't a problem here, because if you write something from a synchronized block, then uh, it's, it's already synchronized, so no other thread can be in there at the same time. So this is implicitly solved. Yes, uh, just have these there. All right. Um, also, good to know is that there's thread lifecycle semantics, so some things you don't have to make volatile. For example, this one, um, can you expect um, the value foo to be 42 here? Normally, you couldn't, because the JVM can reorder things, right? So it can uh, reorder the write to foo uh, to happen after the thread start, because we don't have any volatile operator here that, that requires ordering. But if you start a new thread, it basically has its own memory implications internally. It will then um, recreate um, all values for the first time once you call start, meaning that the JVM knows that. That's a JVM um, a method. The thread class is a JVM class that's very well known to the JVM. So it will guarantee here that there's an ordering. Uh, so here, for, for an exception, if you start a new thread, you can expect that all values that were written before the start method was called uh, are visible to the JVM um, when, when you start the thread. Yeah, this is called a, yeah, this is basically also giving a synchronization order, and this is like the exception uh, that the JVM gives you, because 
assumingly, if it didn't do that, it would be very confusing. Um, and, and yeah, it's like a, a one, one time thing. Again, program order synchronization order introduced and happens before order uh, between the write to the value foo and the assertion within the new thread that you have started. Uh, this doesn't mean that other threads might observe it in this way, but this particular thread that you started from the same uh, thread will, will be uh, following these semantics. Right. All right, uh, brings us to the next operator uh, that many people do not know that has a um, uh, implication for memory ordering, uh, which is the final field modifier. Look at this program and consider, uh, can this assertion fail? So what are we doing here? We're having a, a static field, um, unsafe publication, and from thread one, we are uh, creating a new instance of this field. And um, within the constructor of this class, we will uh, set the value foo to 42. So will this value always be 42? Uh, and what we, of course, have to do from set two, we have to observe if the instance is already set. Uh, but if it is set, uh, we read the value, and then we check that it is 42, actually. So the thing is that if you have a field in Java and you do not initialize it from a constructor, it is set to zero in the first place, right? Also a thing in a Java virtual machine is that a constructor is basically a method call. Uh, if you even look at the bytecode already, the first construction will be an allocation of unsafe in publication. And this uh, allocation call, it will initialize all fields to their default value meaning references are null and primitives are zero. And then after this initial um, allocation, it will call the init method. A constructor in Java is basically in the bytecode level already nothing but a method called init. And the problem here is if you, look at the, if you wrote this code like that, if you had a method call, you would of course not expect foo to be um, necessarily initialized because the init method is only setting foo to 42. Right? So now, suddenly, we can observe the value zero, and the assertion might fail from the second thread. The solution to this is to make the field final, because if you make a field final in the Java memory model, it means that it needs to be visible uh, to all threads. Uh, this is so-called a freeze action. So if a field is final, at the end of the constructor, it will add a so-called freeze action. Again, this is a terminology of the Java memory model and the language specification. And uh, introduce now what is called a dereference order, meaning that if the instance field is read anywhere, then all yeah, final fields of this field have to be visible as well. So if a field is final, then any other thread that can observe this instance will observe the final field values with the value that is set in the constructor. Right? Because this is the constructor call, and again, we have an happens before order, and uh, this time, if we can observe the instance to have been initialized, we will have a guarantee that the foo value is 42, actually. But without it, without the final, we might observe foo to be zero still. Right. So that's basically it. That's the Java memory model. <laughs> if, you, if you ever write concurrent programs, and normally that's nothing you do, but you will at some point in your career, then this is what you have to keep in mind. And of course, um, there's more to it. There's a lot more to it. The devil is in detail, so I'll just show a few. I have 15 minutes left, so hopefully uh, we can get through most of it. Uh, the, 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 the last bit of the Java model, model, uh, namely, is native methods. And this is, again, interesting to understand, um, because native methods are slow in Java. Why are native methods slow in Java? It's not because native calls are slow. It's because it sets limits to what the JIT compiler can do. Let's look at this, this code. Let's say we have a method, mode me method called via JNI, where we assert the value foo of the instance to be zero. Then, uh, after that method, we uh, set uh, the value to 42. Now, the Java virtual machine, of course, has a JIT compiler that operates on Java bytecode. The JIT compiler doesn't know what happens in native methods, so it cannot reorder them. Right? If there's a native call, then this native call will happen in the exact order uh, as it is in, in the Java source code. But as we learned before, the Java virtual machine often has good reasons to reorder code, um, and therefore um, um, it, it would maybe have a reason to do it here as well. But it cannot because it doesn't have an ability to look into what JNI is doing, what the native code is, is actually representing, because it's not processable by the JIT compiler. 
So, so these so-called external externalizations again introduce an order um, where the order has to retain, be retained from the source program, right? Because the side effects cannot be observed from from the JIT compiler. Uh, another uh, exception is so-called thread divergence actions, and that's not something that's normally important to understand. Can this assertion ever fail, right? We never will get past while true in the first thread. So can the second thread um, observe the value 42 anyways? Because we just learned there can be reordering, right? Foo might be written before we even uh, enter the loop. But if the Java virtual machine detects a, a thread divergence action, meaning that the thread never exits uh, over a certain point in the code, then it will never reorder the code that comes after the divergence to happen before the, this, the divergence itself. So basically, this instruction will never be executed. It's a, it's a very um, yeah, sidelined um, um, guarantee by the memory model, but it's still something that is guaranteed, right? Uh, a last part also, like uh, you probably have heard, don't let the this instance escape from the constructor. And that's true. If you remember what I told you about the final modifier, the, the freeze action is only added at the end of the constructor. So the memory model implications do not hold if you pass the this instance during the constructor call. But if you do this in one thread, there's absolutely no problem with it. So you can just let it escape, and, and as long as it isn't multi-threaded. Um, right. So, right. OK, that's the Java memory model for you. I have um, 10 minutes left, so I'll go through some uh, things that you might encounter in, in different um, yeah, scenarios, uh, which are common in, in Java. And the first thing is double-check blocking. So with all. It's like an application now of the Java memory model. If you ever seen this code, can you consider if this is correct? If you think about it a second, we have a static field. Basically, let's say it's an expensive initialization. The constructor is very expensive to call because it needs to do some I.O. or so. So you want to only have it once, but you want to avoid a synchronization. Why do you want to avoid a synchronization? You just learned that it's very expensive because it avoids ordering in the JIT compiler. So you don't want to make the hot path go through a synchronized keyword because it blocks ordering on the, on the processor and on the JVM. So to avoid this, we put the synchronized block in an if. And people think then, all right, I fixed this problem. Now I only have to initialize once. And my, once my pro program is executed um, for the first time, it will be optimized without the synchronized keyword because the instance is set. The problem here is that the last reading of instance is uh, outside of the synchronized block, and we just learned that a happens before relationship is only established between th two threads if they enter the same monitor. So here that's not happening. So indeed, this assertion here might fail because of it. Right? You might again observe foo to be zero because uh, of the constructor pairing that we've seen before. The only way to avoid this, right? Uh, whoops, is to make the static field volatile. And now we have the same happens before relationship as we had. And this is how double check blocking is the only way to, to implement in Java. And this is actually how the lazy keyword in Scala or in Kotlin work. This is the bytecode that's generated. So in, in Java, you would have to write it yourself. Um, but actually, uh, there's more, more uh, solutions. You can have final wrappers, because now we learned that a final field will always publish its values. Um, after the final, after the constructor is called. So if you um, put um, basically a field within a final field, uh, if you put an instance within a final field and then read it back from the final field, then you know that this instance will be correctly synchronized, right? This is one solution. Another solution is to have an enum holder, have the, f the, 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 the singleton instance that we just added in the double check locking, have it uh, as part of an enum. Uh, this will also correctly synchronize because of the way how enums are implemented. And actually, if you look at uh, statistics, uh, double check blocking is the least efficient way. The most efficient way is the enum holder. The plain synchronized, however, is the, the, the most expensive. So this is um, a good article about safe publication by Alexei Shibilev, if you want to read about it. Um, and, and this kind of also exemplifies how important it is to get um, concurrency right, uh, especially on ARM. Um, and, and also see how important reordering is for ARM compared to x86. So again, not the, the thing that, that I mentioned before, that you might observe a problem only on, on ARM but not on x86. You also might observe a performance problem only on ARM and not on x86. 
right? So this is something to keep in mind if you want to publish something lazily to multiple threads. Um, yeah, in practice, atomic access, also something very well um, often um, misunderstood. Look at this program. Um, now we learned volatile is, is important to read fields correctly, but is this program correct? Uh, unfortunately, it's not, because uh, foo basically is this operation, foo minus minus. So if you read and write um, uh, a field from multiple threads uh, in this way, it might not be updated atomically. So one thread might read foo to be zero, uh, and then uh, another thread might also read foo to be zero, and then they both decrement them after they read the field already. So even though this is um, yeah, volatile, uh, it's not correctly synchronized for the purpose of this application. In, in these cases where you read and write uh, fields conditionally from multiple threads, you have to use uh, atomic integers. There's the whole atomic API, uh, in the Java 2 machine, so that this is where um, the volatile fields do not hold. And since Java 9, uh, we have method handles for that, and uh, since Java uh, 11, I think we have var handles for that as well. That made, made this possible even without um, yeah, um, these, these APIs in the JVM. But it's, uh, that's too much for a single talk. That's a different concurrency. It's maybe a book even <laughs> to understand, right? OK, um, also for arrays. Uh, if you look at this program, we want to read and write from an array, and so we make it volatile. The issue here is that uh, while the array itself is volatile, the fields in the array are not volatile. And now we are uh, doing the same data race as before, but from an array. But now we do not have a read-write relationship between two threads anymore, because both times we read the array and then write to a field of the array. The only thing that's volatile here is the array itself, but not the field inside of it. So don't confuse volatile and arrays. Typically don't work. If you see volatile arrays, it's, it's normally false. There's an own, again, atomic class in Java, a volatile array, where all fields are, are um, volatile. And uh, there's also var handles in Java 11, which allow you to read and write arrays in a volatile fashion. Yep. Uh, yeah. So. Do you have to worry about this also in frameworks, like, let's say, in Spring? If you have coded with Spring, you have seen this, right? You have some bean, and you have a setter on this bean that sets a, uh, some, some other property. And then you have a post construct, and then you have a method. Can these uh, methods that you write, uh, that you execute in your bean after your Spring context initialization uh, be null despite them having been set from a different thread? The answer is no. And the reason for that is not that uh, the Java 2 machine takes special care of Spring, but the reason is that Spring takes care of the synchronization for you. Uh, within Spring, there's a lot of manual synchronization uh, that they do to make sure that everything is correctly published. So that's just a side note for <laughs> people who tend to say, I can write this myself. Uh, once you enter concurrency, it quickly becomes very complicated. And that's also what I personally find the most uh, difficult thing to do with the Java memory model is that every framework that makes use of primitives in the concurrency model internally basically has to explain how they guarantee concurrency to the outside. Um, it's similar with ACA, for example, ACA actors, if you use that ever. They also have to basically read and write actors back to volatile fields before every execution to make sure that the JVM knows to correctly synchronize values that were um, communicated from one actor to the other. So, so you cannot avoid it, the model, uh, even if you use high-level concurrency primitives uh, like actors or spring, uh, you just have to um, yeah, accept that they do it for you internally. Yeah, um, basically, that's uh, yeah, also something. Uh, if you see something like this in code, what does the author of the code try to do, the synchronized new object, it tries to issue a, a basically a memory flushing on the JVM. And this tends to work, because the Java memory model is, again, a model that uh, is just yeah, a metaphorically speaking something that the JVM has to guarantee. Nobody tells the JVM, however, to, to be stricter than the Java memory model and just, just say, all right, whenever I observe a, a synchronized keyword, I just write all variables back to my memory. And if you do this, if you issue this instruction, you might just achieve this. But you should uh, code against the specification, not the implementation. So this might just stop working in a future Java version. Um, but it's still, I see, still see this in frameworks every here and there, where people try to force the JVM to flush memory to synchronize code. Right. 
Uh, finally, before I relieve you, <laughs> I know it's a lot, uh, this is the, the, the basically the, the, the academic approach. If you read the specification ever, and if you really are writing libraries, if you write frameworks, or if you want to work for a company that writes a lot of concurrent software, then at some point you will have to dig into the memory model. But the memory model will give you this. It will give you program order, synchronization order, happens before order, and committable orders, which is something I completely um, didn't touch in this talk. And then it says what are the outcomes, the possible outcomes in complex concurrent programs. And it's basically the closure of all these sets. So it's, it's set theory, um, but I'm not going to uh, give you um, yeah, much about it. Uh, finally, also, if you want to test concurrent programs, if you want to find out if your program has potential problems, first thing I already explained to you why you have to find hardware that is probably ARM. ARM chips are a good concurrency testing environment. Uh, uh, and then you can write something with a framework that's called JC Stress. JC Stress lets you uh, basically load test a concurrent program. So every thread that you want to represent uh, is just annotated with actor. And then um, you basically write all results that you want to observe for something uh, to, to um, some result value that's injected. And in the end, this is what JC Stresses will do. It will run for an hour, will execute the program again and again and again and again and again by starting up new JVMs and, and, and running them. And then will collect all the values that were observed in this load test. And then you will, if you remember the first slide where I showed you that you suddenly see foo being 3 and bar being 0, despite this not being possible from the source code, it will show you in 2% of the cases that is happening. So if you have something that, if you have a production problem where something crashes and you cannot explain why, but you um, yeah, suspect a concurrency problem, this is a way to validate that. Uh, I've done it before. It's not a fun process, but it's, it's very effective if that's what you have to do. Right. Boop. Uh, also, the Java memory model is still under review. Um, it's been under review for Java 9, but it never made Java 9. It's still not in Java 17. It's chapter 185, uh, 188, I think, now. So in the future, the memory model might become even more comprehensive. Um, but yeah, it's not, we're not there yet, but it's something to keep an eye on. The reason it's not updated is because it's very complex to update, as you can imagine. Uh, hopefully, after this presentation, and yeah, it's yeah, trying to, to make some add additional guarantees into the model. Yeah. I'm running out of time, so I'm just cutting short, uh, but I was almost done. Thank you so much. I hope you learned something. I know it's a heavy topic, so it's good it's in the morning. I'm having a m much lighter session tonight if you want to learn about Java agents and code instrumentation. Uh, thank you so much for coming. Uh, I'm here today and tomorrow, so just find me. And uh, if you want to find some of my open source work, uh, then uh, please find on net. Uh, ByteBody is something I'm most well known for. Uh, so if you want to chat about this, uh, please talk to me as well. Thank you so much. And